The purpose of this podcast is to provide you with an example of a form of close reading, the type of reading you need to get used to doing if you are studying English literature. What I'll do is read the first paragraphs of the original story and then talk about what we learn from them. Some of the ideas will be apparent on this first reading, others from a second or third reading. First paragraph. The two girls were usually known by their surnames, Banford and March. They had taken the farm together, intending to work it all by themselves. That is, they were going to rear chickens, make a living by poultry, and add to this by keeping a cow and raising one or two young beasts. Unfortunately, things did not turn out well. So Lawrence introduces us to Banford and March as girls, partly as a colloquial way of talking about them, but also because he's hinting that despite their age, we are soon to be told they are nearly 30, they are immature, certainly in the way they run the farm, and as it turns out, emotionally too. As readers, we recognise them throughout, mainly by their surnames, even though we do, do come to know their first names. But when Lawrence says we're usually known by, he means known by the world in general, particularly the people of the village. He's making us aware that the girls are living in semi-isolation. They are near the village, but even though they go there for various things, they don't have much communication with the villagers. This is emphasised by the statement that they intended to work the farm all by themselves. A laudable aim, perhaps, but not a good strategy for rural living, where people often have to rely on others to help them out. The plan of trying to make a living out of poultry doesn't sound well thought out either, which is reflected in the way it is phrased, the idea of raising beasts seeming to be an afterthought, and beasts here being used in the traditional agricultural sense, meaning large animals such as cattle. This point will be echoed in another paragraph. Second paragraph. Banford was a small, thin, delicate thing with spectacles. She, however, was the principal investor, for March had little or no money. Banford's father, who was a tradesman in Islington, gave his daughter the start, for her health's sake and because he loved her, and because it did not look as if she would marry. March was more robust. She had learned carpentry and joinery at the evening classes in Islington. She would be the man about the place. They had, moreover, Banford's old grandfather living with them at the start. He had been a farmer, but unfortunately the old man died after he had been at Bailey Farm for a year. Then the two girls were left alone. Here Lawrence moves on to a brief description of the two women and some explanation of how they have ended up at Bailey Farm. We get the immediate and clear contrast between Banford and March as types. Banford as weak, March as robust. The words describing Banford, small, thin, delicate, convey an idea of both her physical and psychological fragility, and Lawrence uses the adjective delicate to describe her a number of times in the story. But Banford is in a more dominant position in the partnership because she is the principal investor, which means that although the girls own the farm between them, she will usually have the deciding say in what happens. The fact that they do own the farm, and that Banford's share has come from her father, reveals the class status of the women, that is, the lower end of the middle class. This is corroborated by the statement that Banford's father is a tradesman in Islington. We can assume that Banford herself and presumably March too are city dwellers, that is, in this case, Londoners, with little experience of rural life. We know that Banford is out of the marriage stakes, it did not look as if she would marry, and that this, combined with her physical weakness, partly explains her father's desire to help her, because without a husband she would have no means of financial support. There is also a shortage of eligible men as a result of the war, but perhaps there is also some other reason for her unmarried status. If so, we are not given any further information on this. 
March, in contrast, is physically more substantial, and this appears in details about her robustness, and the fact that she has studied carpentry and joinery, we should note the Islington connection again, uh, not skills we would expect a woman to learn at this period. It does, however, indicate an independence of attitude. She would be the man about the house. Now, the use of that phrase itself is interesting, since it is clear that this is how the women think of themselves, that is, as an equivalent of a male-female partnership, with all of the implications for roles and responsibilities. And what do we make of the fact that when they had first moved to the farm, they had Banford's old grandfather living with them? We can assume that, having been a farmer himself, he could have been giving them guidance, even if he couldn't take an active part in running the farm himself. After his death, it seems the project started to go downhill. Is there a suggestion here that without the presence of a male, their venture is doomed? Third paragraph. They were neither of them young, that is, they were near thirty. But they were certainly not old. They set out quite gallantly with their enterprise. They had numbers of chickens, black leghorns and white leghorns, Plymouths and Wyandots, also some ducks, also two heifers in the fields. One heifer, unfortunately, refused absolutely to stay in the Bailey Farm closes. No matter how March made up the fences, the heifer was out, wild in the woods, or trespassing on the neighbouring pasture, and March and Banford were away, flying after her with more haste than success. So this heifer they sold in despair. Then, just before the other beast was expecting her first calf, the old man died, and the girls, afraid of the coming event, sold her in a panic, and limited their attentions to fowls and ducks. Not yet thirty, but already described as not young. Average life expectancy at this period was about 55 for women and 51 for men. Average age of marriage, 25 for women, 26 for men. So time is starting to run out for these two. As in the previous paragraph, Lawrence starts with something about the two girls, and then moves on to details about the farm and ends with the death of the old grandfather. What's important here is that we are presented with the inability of Banford and March to make a real success of the farm, despite the gallant enthusiasm with which they set out. Uh, farming is not the business to go into if you cannot cope with uncertainty, and they are not fit for it given their propensity to despair and panic. This is also where the significance of the natural world is brought forward. Uh, which is important because the story is very much about the way in which humans cope with their own animal natures. And the world of non-human animals is the one in which the women find themselves. Hence the details about the heifers, which, ironically being female, are a kind of distorted mirror for the two girls, but which the girls cannot control. And we can certainly see the psychological relevance of the girls' rejection of the second heifer just as it's about to give birth. By choosing to give up on marriage and live in isolation, Banford and March have basically renounced their own biological function as reproductive creatures. Fourth paragraph. In spite of a little chagrin, it was a relief to have no more cattle on hand. Life was not made merely to be slaved away. Both girls agreed in this. The fowls were quite enough trouble. March had set up her carpenter's bench at the end of the open shed. Here she worked, making coops and doors and other appurtenances. The fowls were housed in the bigger building, which had served as barn and cowshed in old days. They had a beautiful home, and should have been perfectly content. Indeed, they looked well enough, but the girls were disgusted at their tendency to strange illnesses, at their exacting way of life, and at their refusal, obstinate refusal, to lay eggs. There are a number of details in this paragraph 
that all hang from one central idea, that the women think life is not made merely to be slaved away, a belief repeated later when they are talking to Henry. In other words, the farm venture is of secondary importance to them. It's a sort of middle-class indulgence that they think will somehow allow them the time to read books and idle their time away. Except, of course, farming is one of the most labour-intensive, time-consuming businesses to be in. That's why they now look on the fowls, their sole livelihood, now that they've got rid of the beasts, with some chagrin but more relief, as trouble. With that attitude, it's no wonder they are struggling. The beasts should have been the main source of their income, but have been replaced by the unproductive fowls. Indeed, the fowls have, in a way, usurped the cattle, since they are moved into the buildings that were originally used for the cattle in old days. This picks up on the comment I made on the first paragraph about the seemingly ill-thought-out plan for the farm. March puts a lot of effort into looking after the hens, but it is, as we can see, a waste of time. Not only that, but her efforts, employing the carpentry skills she learned in Islington, seem comically inapt. What difference does it make to the chickens that they have a beautiful home? Is it just a form of displacement activity by March? Again, Lawrence is quietly drawing our attention to the mismatch between the reality of the life the women have chosen and their perception of it. So there we have it for those paragraphs. It gives you some idea of the process, I hope. So best of luck with the rest of your reading.